There are few, if any, brands that can claim to have been at the forefront of gravel cycling quite like Salsa Cycles. The American brand wasn't just there at the beginning of the gravel boom, they arguably were instrumental in starting it. Today, Salsa Cycles has a huge range of gravel-specific bike models spanning everything from carbon fiber race machines all the way through to mountain bike-like thrashers. And for those looking to get into gravel on a tighter budget, there's the new Journeyer. For 2022, the Journeyer replaces the Journeyman. The wholly revised 6061 series aluminium frame is designed to provide a more approachable geometry with relatively short reach figures and a tall stack. The frame also features a healthy number of accessory mounts and can take full length fenders and racks. Meanwhile, there's tire clearance for at least 700 by 50 millimeter rubber front and rear, or wider again if you're using smaller 650B wheels. The American Adventure cycling brand offers the Journeyer in a staggering 18 different build specs, which span an array of bikes with smaller 650B or larger 700C wheels, and there are options for drop bars or flat bars. As tested, the Journeyer Apex 1 700C retails for $1,800 US. It's a model with 1x11 gearing that has the same waxwing carbon fork, through axle dropouts, and salsa branded touch points as the models above it. This one sits approximately in the middle of the range, with models starting from $999 and topping out at $2,800. A bare frame set with the waxwing carbon fork can be purchased for $799. That's a basic introduction to the new Salsa Journeyer. Now, let's dive a little deeper. All right, we're back at Mountain Tap Brewery in downtown Steamboat Springs, Colorado. Just a quick note, if you hear any background noise, our apologies, this is a working brewery and we're kind of borrowing their space. Anyway, right now we are back after testing this Salsa Journeyer Apex 1 700C. I think we've kind of determined, determined this is sort of like the happy bike, right? Uh, Ellen, why did this bike make you happy? Like, why did it put a big grin on your face when you rode it? So this was the first bike that I tested after I arrived in Steamboat Springs, and it was just like a hop on and go kind of thing. I didn't have to do a lot to make this bike feel fantastic. I didn't even really give that much consideration to the setup. I think I ran the stem at whatever height it was already at, just adjusted the seat height and just kind of went. And just to be able to hop on a bike out the door and just enjoy the ride, I think is really unique. A lot of the bikes that we tested this week I think we all felt really needed to be fine-tuned to our position, but something about this bike was really forgiving. It was very comfortable, and even on the climbs, it didn't feel sluggish. I wasn't going super hard, but it was just a really pleasant ride all around, uphill and downhill. Pleasant and easy mm -hmm. is like that's what I took away from it. I mean, this is designed as an entry level, like as a as an entry into gravel cycling. It's Salsa's answer to just getting more people into the sport, and that's what I took away. It was just it was very easy just to, to jump on and ride. And while you're riding it, it makes cycle, it makes riding gravel easy. It makes it comfortable yeah. and confident. It, it's sort of that long wheelbase just makes the bike very predictable in what it's doing, but not to the point that it's too cumbersome to get it to corner or to, to change direction or to take down a technical trail. It just does everything well. And it does everything quite simply where the rider can probably get away with maybe lacking the skills to be where they are. I mean, Ellen and I were basically like giggling on this test loop that we were on just because we were having so much fun swapping back and forth on this bike. And yeah, for sure, going down, it, it's like super smooth. It's really, really comfortable. The geometry is set up where, like you said, it's, it's forgiving, but it's still really fun to like throw around. And I think a lot of that had to do with how like low slung it is. It feels super compact playful, tossable, all that fun stuff. It looks super compact, but we'll come back to that. We will. What I was kind of surprised about, however, was how good it was climbing. Mm -hmm. it, this is one of the less expensive bikes we have here. It was, I think, $1,800 or so. Um, it's not super light on the scale, but it's one of those bikes that feels a lot lighter going up than I would have expected. Yeah. Climbs are, like, I, I hate to use this because it's complete over, overly used in, in cycling media, but it climbed a bit like a goat, in a sense. Uh, a lot of the other bikes, you'd, you'd sort of, shorter rear end, stiffer, you'd sort of feel the rear wheel skip over rocks as you're climbing, and this one, it just felt planted all the time. It was just really like a sit and spin kind of feel, no matter how rough the gravel got. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I really noticed that today is something I was paying even more attention to because I have ridden this bike multiple times now to sort of see if my initial assessment 
rang true. And with this, I felt like the rear wheel was so solid, even on steeper, rocky climbs. Mm -hmm. It wasn't something, I didn't feel like I was constantly spinning out. I could just stand up and just sort of speed away. And that's something that's super impressive. And yeah, it's really great for an entry level bike too. And these aren't particularly aggressive tires either. Mm -hmm. Nope, 35 mil and not a super treaded tire. 38s, aren't they? I think they're 38s. Are they 38s? They're 38s, Dave. But they still have a, like a solid center tread. Like they're, it's just not a super aggressive tire. The, the rubber is not super soft. Like one test loop in particular that I'm thinking of. I know Ellen, you and I, like we were just clawing off these like little rocky sections that on some of the other bikes we were having a harder time with. And then on the downhill portion, um, like we couldn't keep up with you. And I, which is a common theme of the week, but yeah. <laughs> Dave, why are we so slow? Uh, but you really, in particular, liked how this bike descended, right? I did. I was super impressed with it. Um, it just felt really, yeah, just super capable. It didn't feel like I was on a gravel bike, uh, especially considering sort of the technicality of some of the trails that we were riding. We're riding blue mountain bike trails. Yeah, yeah. Which is, so I mean, it wasn't anything insane, but I felt very comfortable, very confident. Um, yeah, even, well, I guess not to skip ahead, but just all around this bike felt really capable and it, most importantly, it didn't feel like I was on an aluminum frame. It didn't feel like I was just getting like jackhammered the whole time. It was very forgiving uh, and just yeah, a really comfortable ride. I, I have a slightly different opinion because I know James, you feel the same way about that smoothness. Yes, I, Dave, wrong. You're wrong. I, I think my first impression was that it's far smoother than I had anticipated it would be. I expected a low cost aluminum frame to be quite rigid, almost a uh, uncomfortable in its way. It wasn't that. It, it is comfortable and that long wheelbase does allow for some frame flex. I don't think it was as smooth as you're saying it, it is. I, I found it a little bit rougher, especially at speed and hitting into rocks. You could sort of feel that the metal is still actually a rigid frame. <laughs> Despite all that, that's not necessarily a criticism. It is actually quite a smooth riding aluminium frame. Is it possible, Dave, that you're just not as good of a rider as we are? Uh, no, it's totally possible. I mean, Unfortunately, <laughs> my, my torn to be, hand might be proof of that. To be the mediator between you two, because it seems as though no one yeah. can get you guys to actually have a rational conversation about this. Um, I think what it really comes down to, at least in my assessment from my multiple rides, is I think it really makes a, a bike like this can become super capable if you get dialed in on your tire pressure. So if you don't have ideal tire pressure on the day, it's going to feel very rough, but this frame can feel really, really forgiving if you have good tire pressure. Sure. So it's like a little bit more nuanced than just is the frame stiff or is it no, sure. no, forgiving? Sure. Yes, yeah. keeper Ellen. <laughs> Sorry, you're both wrong. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but speaking of tires, one thing that we have to mention is this bike did come with tires that really weren't very big. And if you did want to go hit more aggressive terrain, there's a ton of room in this thing. I think Salsa approves it for like a 45 or a 50. Like you can no, fit, a, like massive a, it's you can massive. fit a massive yeah. tire in this thing. Yeah. Yeah. And I know you and I both felt that if you were able, if you were to take this bike and max out the tire clearance, like this would be a beast of a bike. And I mean that in a really good way. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And Salsa, they wanted, they've basically created this bike to be an entry into drop bar cycling. So it's a person that doesn't know what type of cycling they want to do yet. They might end up being a road cyclist. They might end up being a bike packer. They might do it all. And they've Salsa's kind of created a bike that somehow has managed to achieve it all and actually do a really good job of it. Normally bikes get really compromised when they do that. I'm pretty impressed. Uh, we did run into a little bit of an issue with the sizing, however, right? Mm -hmm. um, so. The four of us here at Field Test were pretty close in, in height, not exactly the same, obviously. Um, but the, this also, I think Dave, you and I are definitely slightly exceeding the limits of what Salsa recommends for this bike. Mm -hmm. um, by, by like two centimeters. By just a little bit. Yeah. And Ellen, you are kind of like more in the sweet spot, I think. But if, looking at this bike, however, I mean, we all kind of came to the conclusion that it, it just seemed too small? Looks like a kid's bike. Mm -hmm. It's um, so low. Yeah, and their sizing is so strange. This is uh, designated as a 53 centimeter. Ellen, you ride ideally, what, a 50, and you can fit a 52 centimeter in most other brands, mm -hmm. yet a 53 centimeter is perfect for you. And then you and I were like 52, 54 normally mm -hmm. in terms of sizing. A 53 centimeter should be perfect for us. And yet I actually couldn't ride that bike 
Officially. Officially. It may I, have I ran a little too much. I was running the seat post quite a bit further than the minimum insertion point. Uh, and even their 55 centimeters is potentially going to be too small for me in that sense. So the fit, the reach to the handlebars was actually great for me. Mm -hmm. uh, and the, the height of the handlebars, great. The seat tube is just too short. Right. So that is definitely something where if you are interested in buying one of these bikes, you definitely should take it out for a test ride. No question. Yes. In terms of the components and everything, I know we have talked a lot about kind of how careful product managers have to be in terms of specking the bikes, especially at these price points, because you just don't have that much kind of money to play with. Ellen, I think you're really pretty happy with how this thing was set up, right? Yeah, I loved the SRAM Apex Group. This is the first time I've ever gotten to ride it. Um, and it was actually kind of interesting for me, like I guess in full disclosure, I've been a SRAM athlete for more than 10 years at this point, but I've always kind of ridden like their newer, nicer stuff. So Fancy stuff. I, it was really interesting to get to ride so many different groups this week and realize that I truly, genuinely preferred the SRAM Apex over pretty much everything else that we had out there aside from the uh, rival access. <laughs> uh, I just think like it's it's so simplistic. It does what it's supposed to do. It's not overly complicated. And as far as mechanical disc brakes go, these were far and away the best performing I agree. this week. Yeah, yeah. I'd still say I would rather have a hydraulic disc brake. Sure. There of were course. times where I'm like, <laughs> I don't have enough brake, and there's someone in front of me, and you know, mm -hmm. whatever it was, like emergency braking, like. My stopping distance is compromised, mm -hmm. but as far as the mechanical disc brake bikes we had, this is the one I'd want to be on. I, I agree. Yeah, I definitely, uh, this week only reinforced my admiration for hydraulic discs, but if you have to have mechanical discs, of course, the price point is very, very compelling for a uh, mechanical disc. These were far and away the best, smoothest, and I think most powerful brakes. And even having the small hoods, like I felt like these hoods worked really well for my hands and it was geared really well. I felt very comfortable with the gearing. So, so I found the gearing really good for our scenario. I would say it's probably over geared for a person brand new to cycling. I think, I think they'd probably want a slightly lighter gearing, which you can do with the swap of a chain ring. Mm -hmm. and, I, and I say that because this bike is likely at some point gonna get bigger tires, it's gonna get bags, it's gonna get heavier. Mm -hmm. And then at that point, the gearing's too high. But it does seem like a good starting point. It's yeah. a great it's starting like point. It's like really close, mm -hmm. whereas some of the bikes felt so overgeared yep. that I wouldn't really know where to start. But having a one by front chain ring, you can change that gearing yeah. it's not more a big easily. Expense. Yeah, yeah, and, yeah, and, and definitely not without spending a whole lot of money. But yeah, having that 40 tooth front chain ring, I think is a good place to start. Um, and overall, in terms of the drivetrain and the brakes, I mean, this also did a really good job. Yeah, one, one unexpected cost that you'll need to factor in with this bike is that tubeless tires are provided, tubeless ready rims are provided, the, the rims are not taped tubeless. So you'll need to pay for rim tape, you'll need to pay for valves, you'll need to pay for sealant. And I think we all agree that that's pretty much a must have in terms of converting this bike to tubeless. Definitely. I don't think you're gonna open up the capability that we experienced without doing that. Yeah, because this bike clearly has so much potential that in order to extract the most fun out of this bike, you have to be able to ride it without worrying about pinch flatting all the time. Yes. Um, I think we all felt rim every yeah. now and then. On yeah, the I think those rims will be a bit tense. It did ding yeah. a rim yeah. today, for Sorry, sure. Sorry, <laughs> Yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean, but the tubeless thing, uh, it's not uncommon at all at this, not even just at this price point, but it's not uncommon even on bikes that are much more expensive that you have to apply the tubeless tape and add the valves yourself and buy the sealant. Definitely not uncommon, but it's definitely something to note on a bike that costs as relatively little as this one does. Um, what about some of the other like finishing kit, like the bar, stem, seat post saddle, stuff I'll, like that? I'll give a shout out to the saddle, just while, while I'm looking at it. WTB saddle, that's a great saddle. Um, it's one of those, it's quite softly padded. It's of a decent width. It's one of those saddles that so many people love and so few people hate. It's, it's, not, it's not a polarizing saddle. It's, it's unoffensive. Kind of a, it's unoffensive. Yeah. It's kind of like a safe one to put on the bike. And it's cool to see a bike of this price point have like a brand name saddle like that that is, is so well known. So many other brands have decided to go the cheaper route putting their own brand of saddle on. Uh, so yeah, kudos to Rosalsa there. Uh, I was just gonna say having that scoop saddle as well, having like with a slightly more like I guess cutout middle is a little bit more friendly for people with female anatomy. Kind of uh, it makes it a little bit more I guess like 
friendly for everyone, whereas some of the other saddles we've seen are definitely like male centric. Yeah, I mean, Salsa, I think we've been pretty, pretty clear in saying that they intended for this bike to be kind of like a fun bike, good accessible bike for everybody. And really, I think they did a good job with that. So, great job. Hey, is there anything that we didn't like about it? No, I mean, the, you've got the seat tube length is the problem. That's, that's going to throw off people of which size they're going to fit mm -hmm, definitely. And, and whether they can even fit this bike. Uh, and then for me, it's just that, that tall gearing was the other, the only other negative I had listed. It's, it's not an issue around here, but I just, I feel like once you load up your bags. And, and that's yeah. relative because tall, like this gearing is lower than some of the other bikes it that is. they have, but for yeah. the intended purpose, you think it's maybe a little tall. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And then $1,800, I mean, it's, it is, it's not it's, cheap. It's not nothing, right? These days, bikes have just gotten more expensive. You look at any other brand, they're sort of all doing this for this sort of price point. Um, but yeah, I mean, for me to really open up that bike, I would like very happily own that bike if it was hydraulic disc braked. Okay, Ellen? Yeah, I think I would say the same, but I would want to see wider tires. And if I own this bike, I would immediately put Kushkor in it. Oh, To like yes. fully unlock its capabilities. Uh, yeah, I would not want to ever. I feel like you can very much outride the tires on this bike with the frames capabilities, so. And I guess that's something to consider because even if you kept the tires the same width that they are, which they're a very versatile size, they're not too heavy, they'd be good for a yeah. wide, wide range of conditions. But if you were to put some sort of foam insert in there, oh my God, this bike would be so fun. It'd be pretty fun. And one thing we didn't talk about is the slightly wider bars and the mm -hmm. slightly flared bars, I feel like just kind of further exaggerates its uh, its capability. So I think really the tires are the weak point here. Right. I mean, my complaints are really pretty minor. So I, we all talked about the kind of super, super excessively low slung frame. Um, I'm a huge stickler for cable routing and I really, it really bothers me when housing rubs on a frame or fork or whatever. And we have this issue on this bike. Uh, there's already paint rubbing off on the front end. It bugs me because if someone, I, I know to put on their like, you know, clear tape or something to keep this stuff from, from rubbing off. Someone buying this bike more likely than not is not going to be thinking about that. And I'd be super bummed if I had spent nearly $2,000 on a bike to have the paint start rubbing off in the first few hours. Mm -hmm. Huge bummer. Um, aside from that though, I mean, again, like this, I think this bike put a smile on all of our faces. It did. It really did. Well, I think we aptly named this the happy bike because we all really liked it. It was super, super fun to ride. Little nuances here and there, but overall, I think Salsa pretty much nailed it. Those are our thoughts on the Salsa Journey or Apex 1700C. If you got any questions or comments, go ahead and leave them in the section below. We'll get back to you as soon as we can. Make sure you hit like or subscribe down below so you don't miss any upcoming content from us here at Cycling Tips. Make sure you also go to cyclingtips.com for the full written article where we'll have a whole lot more detail and still pictures and stuff like that. Thanks again to ASOS for sponsoring this year's field test, and we will see you again in a little bit.